Governor of Cross River State, Ben Ayade, has joined the club of those fighting against an extension of the lockdown. He warned that further lockdown of the country as a strategy to curb the further spread of COVID-19 will spell doom and give rise to uncontrollable restiveness. He stated that locking out is far better than locking down, adding that another two weeks of lockdown will find this country under siege by young people. Joining us for a conversation via phone on this is political and public affairs analyst Kazim Afebua. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So, while sorry, some. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't join your card because of network issues. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you still for your patience uh, with the technology and stuff. So, while some are calling for more stringent implementation of the lockdown in light of the increasing number of infection, there are those, like the Cross River State Governor, warning that extending the lockdown will spell doom and um, rise restiveness among the youths. What's your position on this argument? Well, we actually... We're we actually do not need a uh, uh, governor and the idea of whatever to remind us. Every Nigerian should know that a further extension of this lockdown will not only spell doom, it will also cause unusual threat in the way and manner that people go about their normal business. Don't forget that quite a number of Nigerians are uh, daily income earners. Uh, you have the mechanics, you have organizers, you have cleaners, you have barbers, you have uh, people who engage in everyday business just to make a living. You have drivers, you have Uber drivers, you have taxi owners, and all of that. So, if government is not given palliative that is also responding to the lockdown, then it becomes a problem keeping them at home for a long time. Don't forget that uh, in some areas, I saw the visuals on the television, where some men, some boys, I call them say one million, one million uh, boys, going from house to house, breaking in, you know, stealing, stealing items, and, and telling the people that, well, we are sorry, the only reason we are doing this is because there's no food to eat. So the government must know how to aggregate the collective interest of the people to ensure that they find a way to respond to this economic disaster that is staring us in the face. Okay, I, I want to um, take it from another think tank who is also calling for a review of the lockdown. They mentioned something in a statement I would like uh, your thoughts on as well. Um, they said, according to them rather, since the lockdown commenced, the number of people being infected has climbed steadily and the spread to various parts of the country has continued to rise. It also said that 28 persons have been confirmed to have died on account of the virus, whereas 25 Nigerians appeared to have been killed by security agencies um, in a bid to enforce lockdown measures. They make a strong argument with this particular um, uh, phrase, don't they? Uh, well, the point is, we we have seen the overzealousness of the security operatives at handling you know those who have decidedly come out at various points in time to find you know easy way to make a living out of this lockdown. Bearing in mind that uh, they have not been exposed to any economic benefit from government by way of financing. And uh, you see, that also tells you about the poor management you know, of persons of Nigeria by the agents of security forces when they are confronted with scenarios such as this. This is a noble idea. It's quite, it's quite strange to us. We've not gone through this type of scenario before, at least not in recent time. And so the ability of the police and other security agencies to maintain some level of uh, respect for individual rights in the conduct of the lockdown has been anything but clear. 
Yes. But the point has to be made that government must, as a matter of priority, look for other avenues, other ways by which they can mitigate the economic impact of this lockdown to the extent that Nigerians will understand what they are doing. But I, Kasi, if, if let, I, let, let, me, let me interject and, and look at it from this perspective. Some would say that it's what the situation we are in now is like being caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. On the one hand, people might die. There might be um, a catastrophe if more people get infected. On the other hand, there is hunger and people are looking at what is going to happen if I can't eat. What price are we willing to pay to curb this virus? Could it be too high in the end if we continue with this lockdown? Well, you might, you might, also, you might also take into consideration that uh, we're talking about life and death here. And hunger kills faster than uh, COVID-19. Those who are suffering from poverty, deprivation, and hunger are more likely to die you know, than those who have been infected with COVID-19. You have to balance the equations. Because by the time you see the number of deaths, I would rather want the Nigerian government to take example from labor state. I think the way Amana Lagos government has handled this COVID-19 has been very, very excellent and very impressive. They have not been perfect, but they have been, they have been like uh, the poster ball in confronting this COVID-19. I think federal government should take inspiration from that. If I, if, I, if, I, if I may ask, what has government done in concrete terms for residents of federal capital territory? What has the uh, administration of the federal capital territory as a body, what have they done to mitigate the impact of this COVID-19? They told us we were going to do the isolation centers at the stadium and all of that, according to the speech by the president. As we speak, Abuja, is an, uh, Abuja Stadium is empty. There are no isolation centers there. They've done one isolation center at DJ Dome. That's okay. But how many people are they testing? Are they going from home to home? Are they visiting the communities where you have clusters of people, like 10 people living in one room? In, 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 in Nanya, Karimo, or you do and Gwagwa. But is, is any one there? government, is any one government really um, stepping up to the plates in totality or they're making effort? And if, if we are going to say, okay, the lockdown is something that might be tricky to consider, might we not also give further consideration to what the state governor is saying um, when he called for the decentralization of the battle on COVID-19 so that each state, each unit will be able to find the best approach that works for them other than this um, command or order from the federal government? If yes as well. No. Okay, just go ahead and answer that first. You, are, you, are, you, are, you still understand what I am saying. There is a federal government there is also an FCC administration. What exactly is the FCC administration doing with respect to, you know, mitigating the economic impact of this uh, lockdown? Particularly with respect to people who are residing in outskirts villages like like uh, Kubwa, Beige, Guagua, Idu Karimo, Enyanya, Amaraba, and, and Jikwe. These are places where the poorest of the poor, using the language of government, mostly reside. And if you, if, if you take a further analysis, about 10 people, 10 people will be residing in just one room. How do you observe social distancing in this kind of, in this kind of settlement? How do you also go to test? In the event that one of them gets caught with COVID-19 and decides to come back home, aware that about seven of them are living in the same room. I think government must take a decisive action in ensuring that they increase the testing so that in the final analysis, they will be testing more people on a daily basis rather than just making it like, a, like some kind of slogan. So for me, I have not seen any concrete step being taken to actually apply the social distancing doctrine 
as well as also mitigating the economic impact of this lockdown. And if you, if you decide to extend the lockdown, it is another catastrophe which it will slow. All right. Um, I, I want to bring us to Lagos, where the speaker is saying, um, as against canvassing for, um, I mean, not extending the lockdown, he's saying it is not even effective um, in trying to achieve the purpose of curbing um, the rise in the uh, virus spread because we have more people seeming to get the infection and he's advocating for um, the inclusion of local governments in the fight and in the planning as to the strategies to be used to fight uh, COVID-19. If, if you ask me, I think a lot of, a lot of these uh, persons who are speaking about the involvement of local government and what have you, are just looking for platforms to, to make some quick money from federal government, aware that uh, international donors have also given us some form of assistance or the other. How much of a uh, healthcare facility do we have in the local government setting? How much of healthcare facility do we also have at the state government level? How much of healthcare facility do we have even at the federal government level? I think uh, I want to go by the disappointment of Boss Mustafa, the head of the presidential task force on this COVID-19, who expressed dismay over the rockiness and the comatose nature of the health sector. And he was just getting aware of this by his president's uh, responsibility of presiding over the task force. So when you say extend to look at government, you have to ask yourself, what facility do they have on ground? Do they have testing kits? Do they have the, the personal protective equipment? Do they have other, other equipment that is required, you know, to mitigate this uh, COVID-19? Even some states, you hear them mentioning very big figure. One billion or two billion of what was expended on feeding people or buying food for the locals. And these conditions are cannot be charged. So I think it, I don't want us to see this as another opportunity to make quick money into their pocket. The government should take the decisive step to open up the economy right now before we begin the process of having another explosion whose end we may not predict. All right, let, let's look for um, one uh, conversation that has to do with um, a further solution to this problem. And that is looking for a more localized approach, the exploration of the use of local herbs as a possible cure for coronavirus. Um, the Speaker of the House in Lagos is not the only one. We have the only knee. We have some props that are coming up to say all of these seem to be um, educated men who are well-traveled. So, what, in your opinion, there are fears, rather, of a catastrophe if we cannot manage uh, this um, disease? Shouldn't government be taking such recommendation a little more strongly? Well, everything government can do to provide a response to this COVID-19 will be a welcome development. I heard earlier on that... Uh, Professor Morris Kiwu told Nigeria that they found the cure for COVID-19. And I wouldn't know today what government has done to cultivate him or approach him to also find out the details of what his recovery is. But more talking more seriously as Africans and as Nigerians, whatever that is available that can mitigate the, the spread of this COVID-19, that was only to the cure of it. I think we should take that very seriously. I, I was reading uh, the governor of Oyo State, uh, Engineer Martin Day, when he said that he used local help, you know, in the treatment of his COVID-19 when he was tested positive. I think we should borrow a bit from him and find out what the local help were and how to also in a standard theory to ensure that we are able to get remedy for this pandemic. Otherwise, we'll be rotating on the same avenue, locking down people at home, increasing hunger, increasing poverty, increasing deprivation, and at the end of the day, 
you might be putting another pandemic that is worse than COVID-19, and that is the hunger pandemic. All right. Thank you very much for joining us on the program tonight. It's a pleasure. Just like I said earlier, I'm sorry that I couldn't get on that because of network. Uh, it's okay. At least we're able to speak with you. Thank you again. All right. It's a pleasure. We will take a plus report now, and when we return, I'll give my take. Please don't go away. With residents desperately in need of palliatives, indeed the lockdown within the federal capital has been a trying experience. The FCT administration were commending residents for their efforts in trying to obey the lockdown directives, says it is not unaware of the hardship being faced by many. We appreciate the pain. We know some move day and feed by the day. And we told them to sit at home under lock and key. We know it's not going to be easy, but we admonish you to please adhere strictly to the rules to save life if you do love your loved ones just like we do love you. While the administration commenced its distribution of palliatives to about 600,000 households desperately in need, several private organizations have come out to show their support by donating foodstuff to support their FCT. Our purpose of being here is not far-fetched. We know what is happening globally, and FCT is not an exception. And we felt we cannot be in FCT, operating in FCT, and not respond at this point in time. So we have come here today to donate something that will help in our palace, what we call stomach infrastructure. Government is run by the people for the people and everyone. So we have to be able to help government because actually the people are government, but they represent us and help us to run it. So we just decided to bring in our own uh, widow's might so that uh, you can, we can be able to help the FCT reduce the burden of helping people to maintain hygiene, to be able to get some food stuff, and uh, to see that the government is supported for them to help others. We brought some items here. As you know, in Nescaf and Cali, we don't manufacture anything. What we're known for is our bread, which we brought in quantum, a lot of it, and um, just to assist in what you're doing. We are here to present these products to, to you, madam, so that we're able to get to the, to the interiors where we can all reach. We cannot do it alone. That's why we want to partner with FCT to make sure that these products get to where they're supposed to get to. We have decided to bring in some support to help with what they are doing. And um, this is just the beginning. We've been going into some suburbs and feeding communities. We still have a major one to do on Sunday for about 1,000 people. The Minister of State for the FCT, Dr. Rukaya Tijani, commended their efforts, saying the administration will not be quick to forget their gesture of goodwill. Dr. Rukayat were commending these organizations for their support, assured its distribution will be transparent and just. We have an organogram here that cuts across from top to bottom that will ensure that the same application is done to ensure the targeted recipients get what is desirous. And this will go a long way to cushion the effect of the sitter's room as ordered by Mr. President, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Amadin Uyi, Plus TV Africa. China accounts for around a quarter of our country's imports. Her funding supply seems bottomless. Much of our crucial infrastructure has been and is being built by them. Even before this pandemic, that country's economic health was and is crucial for oil prices our cliché revenue source. Since this COVID-19 outbreak, a Japanese billionaire donor, Jack Ma, jacked up to some degree Nigeria's response to the pandemic with crucial supplies. I guess it's nice to mention that we weren't the only beneficiary. The likes of Ethiopia, Uganda, and Rwanda benefited. They have also supplied us with medical air spots, as having largely beat the virus to help us better streamline our response. So forgive me if I don't hold much faith in a tough talk by Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs. I am of the opinion that the many loans, donations, in summary, goodwill from China will have a bearing on our government's response to the strong accusations of racism and discriminatory practices against Nigerians and other black people. For as they say, 
you don't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, do you? Still, it has to be said that the behavior towards Africans in China is totally reprehensible to all lovers of freedom. There is absolutely no justification for what we saw in the videos, from the evacuation to enforced isolation and repeat testing, despite already testing negative for COVID-19. The only way a strong message can be achieved, or rather a strong response can be achieved in my thinking, is if African leaders collectively utilize every negotiation advantage to elicit an unreserved apology and commiserate compensation from China for the assaulted Africans. It should be seen to have been done if they are to score with the people that they lead. And that is my take. As always, Thanks for watching. You can watch all episodes of Plus Politics on our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. The program returns Monday, same time. Until then, please be well.